So good morning, everyone, to uh, or good afternoon, everyone, to our second episode of our Fusion Energy webinar series hosted by the IEA. And this episode will be a special episode. We will cover uh, Fusion Energy at COP28, a promising uh, emerging climate solution. So following COP28, we see nuclear is on the rise. Nuclear fusion is being mentioned more and more. And with the recent announcement of the International Engagement Plan for Fusion Energy at COP28, and in follow-up to the recent UK-US joint statement on fusion, our panelists will discuss their perspectives on these announcements and the wider fusion outlook after COP28. Fusion is developing fast and gaining momentum as a climate solution. The COP28 Climate Summit in Dubai highlighted the critical turning point reached by fusion energy and the growing consensus that international partnerships in fusion are the way forward. So our speakers today are Scott Su, Su a senior advisor and lead fusion coordinator uh, for the Office of the Undersecretary for Science and Innovation at the U.S. Department of Energy. We have Tim Bestwick, the Chief Devel Development Officer and Deputy CEO at the UK AEA, UK Atomic Energy Authority. We have Stephanie Diem, an Assistant Professor from the Department of Engineering Physics at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And finally, we have Andrew Holland, the Chief Executive Officer of the Fusion Industry Association. I'm your moderator, Adam Danielowicz, and I'll be glad to present host and moderate this webinar. We'll start off presentation first with Scott from the Department of Energy, who has kindly agreed to give a high level overview of fusion and deliver his opening remarks on the US uh, International Engagement Plan for Fusion Energy announced at COP28. So the floor is yours, Scott. Thank you, Adam. You can hear me okay? Yes. Uh, gre greetings to everyone around the world. I'm excited to participate in today's IAEA Fusion webinar. It was just a little over two years ago that I, along with Tim Bestwick and Andrew Holland uh, here today, uh, participated in the IAEA Fusion webinar, Pushing for Fusion Energy in November 21. Since that time, the technical progress and growing momentum in fusion have both been remarkable. Uh, today, I focus my remarks on the U.S. Fusion International Partnership Strategy which was announced last week at COP28 by U.S. Special Presidential Envoy for Climate, John. Secretary Ke Kerry captured things well when he said, we are edging ever closer to a fusion-powered reality. And at the same time, significant scientific and engineering challenges exist. Careful thought and thoughtful policy are going to be critical to navigate this. The Biden administration has prioritized tackling the climate crisis at home and abroad with the goal of reaching net zero emissions economy-wide by 2050. The United States is mobilizing its innovation enterprise to accelerate the next generation of clean energy technology breakthroughs to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, promote energy security and resilience, and advance economic development. The White House Net Zero Game Changers Initiative, announced in November of 2022, recognizes that while the U.S. continues to demonstrate and deploy more established technologies, we must also focus on nurturing a pipeline of emerging technologies that will make it substantially easier or cheaper to reach net zero. It is within this context that the U.S. bold decadal vision for commercial fusion energy is being pursued to set an ambitious plan for development, demonstration, and deployment of commercial fusion energy over the next decade and beyond as part of an innovation agenda to develop clean energy solutions. Of course, the reason we are all excited about fusion is its potential to become, become a globally scalable clean energy source with on-demand availability, manageable risks associated with safety and radioactive waste, abundant fuel if we are successful in breeding tritium, and sustainability through high energy density and low land use. Fusion could help the world meet rapidly growing clean energy demand. Furthermore, the availability of firm energy sources like fusion better enables a diverse clean energy portfolio that lowers overall energy system cost while increasing energy security and reliability. To advance our bold decadal vision and for the eventual global deployment of fusion energy, international cooperation is essential. Our international strategy announced at COP28 last week by Secretary Kerry is entitled International Partnerships in a New Era of Fusion Energy Development and has five pillars, 
fusion research and development, including shared access to and development of key test facilities, growing the future global fusion marketplace, including supply chains, promoting the alignment of regulatory frameworks, fostering a diverse global workforce pipeline, and finally, strong public engagement on fusion energy. Placing research and development uh, first is intentional. Science is the backbone of the current and future fusion enterprise. Continued progress toward realizing commercial fusion energy relies on efforts to work together across nations to accelerate scientific progress. Continued emphasis and cooperation among countries, across public and private stakeholders, through enabling access to a shared development of key infrastructure, and by leveraging international projects like ITER, is central to bridge the significant science and technology gaps ahead of a fusion future. As we work to address the science and technology gaps, we need to simultaneously foster a broader enabling environment for commercial fusion energy. This includes growing the global fusion marketplace by facilitating fusion's market entry and building engagements with relevant stakeholders to identify supporting technologies, manufacturing capabilities, and current and anticipated global supply chains for global fusion deployment. Our strategy also includes encouraging coordination with global partners to enhance dialogue on technical and policy issues to support the alignment of regulatory and export control frameworks for fusion. The fusion timeline presents an opportunity to intensify needed efforts across educational and professional levels and relevant sectors to grow a diverse fusion capable global workforce. We need robust workforce development pathways to support progress from science to prototypes to deployed technology. Opportunities to engage with partners to share educational resources and best practices that encourage talent exchanges will help grow the global fusion workforce. Lastly, just as foundational R&D comprises the first pillar, public education and engagement intentionally serves as the other bookend pillars. To facilitate eventual commercial fusion deployment, we must engage starting now with the public. Building widespread understanding and early trust will help facilitate a social license for fusion energy as a safe, responsible, and clean energy solution. Together, this plan underscores the United States view that international cooperation and partnerships are essential to realize timely commercial fusion energy. And we look forward to and invite engagements with our existing and new international partners. Thank you, and I look forward to the discussion to follow. Thank you, Scott. Now we'll give the floor to Tim Bestwick from the UKAEA, who will give his opening remarks from the UKAEA's perspective. Thank you. Thank you, Adam, and uh, thank you, thank you, Scott, for that very helpful introduction. Um, as Adam said, I'm Tim Bestwick. I'm Chief Development Officer and Deputy CEO at UK AEA. It sounds like the UK Atomic Energy Authority would do all things atomic, and once upon a time we did, but now and in recent decades, we've very much focused on fusion. For the last 40 years, we've hosted JET, which I'm looking at out of the window behind my screen, and JET is now going into the coming days of doing its last science experiments and will enter decommissioning early next year, which is a, a pretty significant end of an era for us and the whole community that's been using JET as a, as a tool and, a, and an experimental facility. UK AEA is now arranged as a series of centres of expertise to cover the major technical aspects of fusion including the integrated engineering, the tritium technology, the materials, remote maintenance and others. And alongside that, we are also responsible for the UK's recent major step power plant development program, which is aiming to put prototype power plant fusion plant connected to the grid um, in the 2040s. UK AEA has grown very rapidly in recent years, along with the interest in fusion and the focus on the fusion program. And, the number of people we have has, has doubled in the last five years to about uh, 2,400 now at, at Cullum, where I am. UK AA centres of expertise work with other fusion organisations across the world, public and private, and across the spectrum of technical approaches, although our particular technical heritage is mainly in the, in the Tokamak approach. Uh, and that collaboration is really essential, and I, I want to echo 
Scott's words in that, the nature of the challenge that we all face in bringing fusion to be a deployed technology to, to a product status is, is so substantial that we really have to collaborate and in many areas just can't afford to duplicate. And that's not to say that there will not be inevitable competition within the private sector, but, but the, the underpinning investment that's required is, is too large for everyone to do their own thing. UK AEA STEP programme and our fusion industry programme and indeed our other programmes are all aiming to develop the industrial base in fusion, which we see as key towards progress towards uh, actual power plant product, a deployed power plant, which is of course where we all need and want to end up. To further foster collaborations, we're developing Cullum as a campus to be a fusion innovation campus with a real mix of public and private organizations with a common interest in the field, using common facilities and sharing expertise where they're able to. And we're developing some of the spin-off technologies from fusion in our innovation program. It's something we don't talk about so much in fusion, but broadly speaking, you can't have that many clever people working so hard on things that are so difficult without the fusion community inventing all kinds of things which have applications in other markets. And, and we'd like to play our part in developing and exploiting those too. My area of UK AEA works on business communications and innovation and campus development. And having a close and productive relationship with businesses of all types is really important to us and central to the future of fusion. I, I don't need to tell anyone here the huge size of the challenge of delivering deploying fusion energy. Um, but one of the interesting balances that all of us in the field try to make on a daily basis is balancing that realism about the size of the challenge and what we still have to tackle and mature as technology to deploy um, with the enthusiasm we have for progress in the field and, and what an, an extraordinary impact fusion is going to deliver to us all and, and be a, a, a you know, a really globally changing technology. I, I was very taken with um, John Kerry's comment that Scott quoted, which is it's going to require careful thought and thoughtful policy, um, which is, I think, spot on. And that balancing act between huge enthusiasm, but you know, wide-eyed realism about what we still have to tackle is, I think, something that, that we have to um, be uh, face up to debate and, and sort of position ourselves carefully so that we bring everybody with us. And, and again, another aspect that's already been touched on is, is the need to communicate widely about fusion, its opportunity and its challenges. I wasn't at the most recent COP, but fusion did indeed feature higher than ever before. It's the profile of fusion gets higher and higher. And I think that's because of that increasing widespread realization that an energy source with the attributes of fusion is very much needed in the global energy mix. It's an essential part. And so the pressure is really on us as a community to step up to that and collectively deliver. Uh, and as has been said a number of times, I think that inevitably absolutely requires widespread collaboration. Thank you. Thank you for your opening remarks, Tim. Now let's move on to Steffi Diem from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and she'll give her opening remarks. Um, we'll, give you, we'll give the floor to you, Steffi. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here, and thank you so much for the invitation, and thanks for everyone who's joining today. Really, it's a truly unique time for fusion. We've all seen that fusion is happening, and it's moving really fast right now. Um, I think we're all very cognizant that we're here today due to decades of hard work, and also, this convergence that we have right now of so many things from manufacturing, large scale computing, new technology, a community plan, and, and kind of a global effort really to close those remaining technical gaps, coupled with a growing private sector. We've also had major recent achievements um, with record results from JET, and especially those NIF ign uh, reaching ignition last year, achieving what we have been challenged as a field to demonstrate. That's the feasibility of controlled fusion here on Earth. And they even repeated those results again this year. So now is the time to find creative pathways to really tackle those remaining technological and societal gaps to accelerate the development and deployment of fusion energy systems in support of an equitable energy transition. So I'm really excited to see what this US international partnership and also the UK US 
uh, agreement will look like, um, those details of that, those both of those. And I'm really excited to watch these partnerships grow. We really have a unique opportunity right now to embed environmental justice and energy equity into the design of these fusion energy systems. And this will take a global effort to really build fusion for everyone. This is our opportunity to really do things differently from the start, and we can start leveraging this U.S. international partnership and the U.K.-U.S. agreement for fusion energy development. And we can start to address these uh, some of these interdisciplinary challenges. I'm talking about these societal, economic, and environmental impacts of fusion energy at a global scale in parallel to our efforts of closing those technology gaps. This will then allow us to build societal consent through trust and transparency while we accelerate our efforts to move fusion energy out of the lab and into society to, to address the global challenges of the climate crisis, energy security, and support technological and economic growth in all countries. And now I'm just going to mention kind of three aspects of fusion technology development. And these that I'm going to mention are really independent of a specific approach. I know we have a unique opportunity to explore a variety of different approaches to fusion. Um, and these, these aspects of fusion technology development that I'm going to mention, we really need to start addressing now. And I've really worked on identifying these with my colleague, Professor Aditi Verma at the University of Michigan. And then we've identified these three kind of pillars. Uh, the first is to look at an understanding of the environmental impacts of fusion energy across the whole technology life cycle. This includes resources and where they're mined, and along with decommissioning and radioactive waste storage, recycling, and clearance of materials. And an interdisciplinary approach is really needed to focus on a critical assessment of the impacts of fusion energy, looking at kind of two things, an equity-focused social and environmental life cycle assessment. This is really looking at who experiences different impacts of the technology and the resource and mining extraction with a strong focus on inequities in these impacts across locations, time, and for different populations. And we can also start to look at a dynamic life cycle assessment. One example of this being how the impact of demand for critical minerals depend uh, on the increased demand in other sectors. Um, lithium is a great example of this. And the second aspect I'm going to mention is we can start by looking at developing unique methods of risk and safety assessment for fusion. So historically, we've relied on a whole system uh, design to be designed to actually do that risk and safety analysis. And by the time that a company has invested in this, they've put in a substantial amount of money. Um, and so they're going to be reluctant to change these designs at this point. So we can really rethink and take a different approach that does not rely on a whole system design to be designed to make decisions on the risk and safety analysis. The third is really to start working on engaging communities earlier in the design process. And this, this speaks to providing opportunities uh, to approach community engagement through meaningful two-way engagement where we can start to understand community members' hopes and concerns for fusion energy systems and start this dialogue with um, technology developers. And my colleagues and I have started our initial efforts in these areas at our universities. Uh, universities are really a perfect environment for this work, as we already have experts in a lot of these areas that we can easily collaborate with, and we're also flexible enough to pivot on our approach as well. However, these efforts I've mentioned have really focused on the U.S. and to develop, to develop fusion for everyone across the globe, we need to start engaging um, broader. Uh, these are broader communities, broader fusion developers across the globe. So these, the U.S. International Partnership and the U.K.-U.S. Agreement can really help support efforts like this, and this information can be incorporated into these efforts to develop an international policy and standards for fusion. And the five areas that Scott mentioned that are involved in this U.S. international partnership are really entwined with all those three aspects that I mentioned. And I just want to close with this. I mean, fusion draws a lot of us, right, to work on this. It gives us hope in a world where we have weaponized energy and energy resources and access to minerals used in energy production. And we also have an amazing challenge ahead of us to commercialize it. Commercial fusion energy systems have the potential to provide the world with carbon-free electricity, among, among other uses. 
and it can really provide a way to power the next phase of humanity. And fusion is engineering at the, at the extremes. And while there are still many challenges that lie ahead for fusion, I think we all see that the potential benefits are huge. And I'm really excited to see more details and how these international efforts will be coordinated will be coordinated as we continue to push innovation and drive towards a cleaner, more sustainable and equitable future. And thank you so much. Thank you, Steffi, for the excellent points raised in your, in your opening remarks. I'm sure we will have a chance to discuss in the wider discussion later about all the points made. And now we'll give the floor to Andrew Holland, the CEO of the Fusion Industry Association to give his opening remarks. I'll give the floor to you. Uh, and it's uh, it's always a, a challenge to go last when uh, everybody has already said so many great and important things. So um, in my talk here, I'm going to give a, a brief overview of the state of the private fusion industry, our our goals, our timing, the the size, and our growth. And then I'm going to to switch gears a little bit, especially after COP, to talk a bit about the international sphere and, and how international collaboration can support and grow and what we can do. Uh, and then, then I'll get off the stage and look forward to our, our discussion and, and questions. So uh, I am the CEO of the Fusion Industry Association. We represent the emerging private fusion energy industry. We have 38 members uh, that range in size from you know, over 600 employees and uh, billions of dollars in private investment down to uh, companies that are two or three people and have raised a couple of hundred thousand dollars literally working in a garage. Uh, but what they all share is a plan for commercialization and that they have convinced investors to, uh, to invest in, in fusion. Uh, it's, it is a stark and kind of amazing growth that we've seen the FIA uh, Scott mentioned that that we did the one of these IAEA webinars two years ago. At that point, we were only six months old as an independent association. The FIA has grown since we started from 24 members to 38 members, and that growth has it's not just purely linear. We've seen significant. Um, we, we've some have left, some have have come, as you'd expect in a uh, startup economy. We now have over $6.2 billion invested in private fusion companies around the world. In the last year, we have seen 13 new fusion companies either emerge from, um, from stealth mode or startup or you know, it's in some way, you know, we identified them as new. Uh, so, so there is significant growth. We've seen in the last two years, from uh, from about the time that we did this this last um, meeting uh, that that Scott mentioned, uh, we've seen over four billion of that six point two billion dollars in private investment come. So it's an accelerating curve, accelerating uh, time frame. And so the answer, the, the question that that is begged is why is this happening? What is going on that uh, that it, that is indicating that fusion is moving from the public sector, you know, represented here by Scott and Tim and, and the universities represented by Steffi, you know, and moving into the private sector. Why is this suddenly happening now? Well, what we think is it's a combination of supply and demand, you know, supply being basically fusion is ready. Steffi mentioned the NIF breakthrough and, and Tim mentioned JET, you know, the, the, the major uh, announcements of, of the DT campaign at, at JET a couple of years ago really indicated another, uh, another waypoint on this pathway towards fusion energy. We, we are confident enough that it will work. When we build these next machines, they will work. We are confident of that because we have all of this demonstrated uh, scientific growth over time. There has been uh, continuous progress over the last 30, 40, 50 years uh, towards the, these breakthroughs. This is not just 
you know, some it, it, science doesn't happen just in, in the light bulb moment that, oh my God, it just happened. It, it, these are companies standing on the shoulders of giants and, and moving forward. So, so fusion is ready and you combine that with the fact that the world needs fusion. And that was underscored at, COP, at the COP and underscored the fact that we need a new zero carbon firm source of energy. We know that renewables are growing fast. We know that solar and wind are growing as fast as they can. Combine that with battery storage and you can, you can go a long way towards decarbonizing your electric grid. But the fact is, is that in developed economies, electricity is only a third of the total emissions. So you have to figure out a way, other ways to do that. And also, as you get closer to 100% renewables, you, you, you start to have significant problems with your grid. So, so you need a firm source of energy. Scott mentioned this. Fusion can provide that, and investors are looking at that now. Uh, and so, so investors see this, there's a demand signal from the, the large companies who will be the, the buyers of this. I'd note that for the first time this year, um, we have a power purchase agreement for fusion energy. Microsoft is contracted with Helion Energy, one of our leading companies, to, uh, to purchase 50 megawatts of fusion electricity in 2028. This is a significant and uh, accelerated time frame, and uh, and it, it signals that there is a need for this, and this is a, a a climate solution that businesses want, and increasingly that the inter that that we need for international politics, international global affairs. Um, Nothing has driven the need for energy, for clean energy and fusion energy in particular, more than events in, uh, over these last two years, uh, in particular, the, uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, which is, is very clear would not have happened had there not been energy geopolitics happening. And so fusion has has risen to the top as as something that can provide that always on and always available source of energy. Uh, our companies are confident that we can meet there. <laughs> we are very aware that fusion is hard. Fusion is challenging. There's a lot of, of still a lot of science le left to be done. A lot of open science that we have to have to get to. With that, let me let me switch a little bit to this this international um, uh, landscape, and I think it's appropriate we're talking about this at the the IAEA because, of course, it was uh, President Eisenhower's Adams for Peace speech back in the um, uh, 1953, I believe. I, I believe we just we just hit the um, the, the I guess it's the 70th anniversary of the Adams for Peace speech last month. And that that led to the creation of the IAEA, the ability to, you know, internationalize and and build a, a peaceful use of atomic energy. Now we're and, and fusion, of course, the IAEA was the, the place where in the late 1950s, the United States and the Soviet Union and the UK um, agreed to basically open the books on fusion science and start to share internationally the science that was being done and the work that was being done. And of course, we, we had the, the fusion energy conference in London uh, just in October that was the latest iteration of this. This is really important that there's a long history of collaboration even among rival nations on fusion science and, and fusion development. But of course, we have to be clear eyed that the geopolitics of 2023 are not the same as the geopolitics of the 1950s. It's no longer two pure uh, adversarial blocks looking at it against each other. It's a more diverse and multipolar world uh, where, the, yes, there are geopolitical rivalries uh, and countries are going to be um, increasingly using fusion as a part of these geopolitical rivalries. We, as the private sector, have to both uh, be aware of this and be involved. In some places, collaboration will, will win over, and in some places, competition will win over. 
I'm, I'm happy to talk through details and what this might look like and everything like that. But I'm glad to know that the US government has put out this, this international fusion strategy for the 21st century. You know, we, we've had international collaboration and fusion, obviously, for, for 60 years now, more. But now it's, it's time to, to update that and, and discuss how this will, will work in the 2020s and, and beyond as we move from a, a scientific collaboration into the increasingly competitive uh, commercial landscape. So with that, uh, I look forward to questions and happy to be with you all. Uh, it, it's, it is a good marker to have done this now two years later. I'm glad Scott mentioned that. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew, for those opening remarks. I will begin with the questions now, and I've got my first question to Scott. So what would you say are the main objectives and benefits of the international engagement plan for the US and its international partners in fusion energy development? And how does the plan address the challenges and opportunities of fusion energy innovation and commercialization in a global context? Uh, Adam, thanks for the question. Um, of course, that, that's a very meaty question. I'll, I'll, I'll give a, a brief answer. Uh, what I'll say is the two key objectives and benefits of the plan are, are firstly, to mutually leverage the complementary strengths and capabilities of partner countries so as to accelerate progress and hopefully save costs for each partner. Okay, that, that's, you know, a rather pragmatic way to advance our collective vision toward, toward the success of fusion. Um, and secondly, to provide an inclusive partnership framework um, for both existing partners and new partners with very different levels of interest and capabilities in fusion. Um, and this will help lay the foundations for eventual global commercial fusion deployment. Um, the, the plan will hopefully lead to expanded and new partnerships. Uh, one example, of course, we can already point to is the US-UK fusion joint statement that several uh, of um, uh, the speakers have already mentioned. As part of this partnership, new collaborative priorities of mutual interest and of strategic importance to advance the fusion plans of each country will be identified and pursued. Um, I, you know, we can talk, I think, at greater length on this question, but I'll, I'll stop there for now. Thank you, Scott. And with that, I will ask a very similar question to Tim regarding the UK-US partnership and what are the main objectives and benefits of this new strategic partnership uh, on fusion energy development and what's the UK AEA's role and perspective on this? Sorry, I think you're muted. I didn't think I was muted. Now you're back. I'm back. Can you hear me now? Yeah, uh, yeah thanks, Adam. Um, it's early days in this agreement, um, but we really are delighted to have got this collaboration in place. And early next year, we're going to be getting down to defining more detail. And it's just worth noting, we're not starting from scratch. There's lots of great collaborative work and there's lots of strong collaborations between organizations in the in the US and the UK existing already. So this isn't a, a starting point. It, it, it's really just figuring out, figuring out how we take collab collaborations to the next level. Um, I think from a UK perspective, um, we we are looking, I suppose there are two things I would highlight. One is that we're looking for complementarity. Um, I think Scott, Scott mentioned this. Um, the fusion public sector fusion program is taxpayer funded. The taxpayer quite reasonably expects the best value for their tax dollar. And they don't want us to duplicate what might be done elsewhere and we could benefit from. So it just seems obvious um, to start by collaborating on, on things like expensive test facilities. So in the UK, we're, 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 we have a fusion fuel cycle facility that's high on our, on our list of priorities that we're, we're just starting to get planning and implementing now. And, and talking about how that works in a complementary way with the US plans is just really important to us. So, so the complementarity is, is one part. And then another part is just the scale of the challenge. We mentioned this already. Um, for example, the scale of the challenge in, in simulation and computing to accelerate fusion is huge. It really is huge. It's, it's far greater than any single organization could, could manage. So it just makes sense to collaborate divide up that challenge between us, make as much progress together as we can. So 
So it's it's collaboration to get scale, it's complementarity and and um, what it isn't, of course, is is a blending of our national programs. National programs will always be national programs, but but together by collaborating, we can be more efficient and more effective. Thank you for that great answer. I will give the next question to Steffi. You mentioned earlier in your introduction about how fusion energy must be adjusted and sort of e equitable energy transition, and we must think about all the stakeholders. So. How do you, in your opinion, how can international cooperation promote diversity, equity and inclusion in the fusion workforce? And what are some of the strategic or uh, strategies or initiatives that could attract and retain talent from different backgrounds, genders and cultures? Because you mentioned earlier, you've been working primarily in the US and you would like to see more sort of diversity in, in the workforce. So how do you think international cooperation can promote that? Thank you so much for that question. I think we've all kind of seen the studies that diverse teams lead to innovative solutions faster. And so we've also recognized that fusion really isn't that diverse of a field right now. So we really need to start actively working on changing this. This is diversity of thought, um, background, ethnicity, race, religion, all different facets of diversity. Um, International co cooperation can really provide a pathway for more creative approaches to this. We can look at technical schools at, uh, across nations to bring in students and researchers um, across nations, but also from different STEM adjacent fields as well. We can also look at an exchange of researchers, technical experts, and students in a variety of fields that are really need to, needed to tackle the challenges of commercial fusion that we mentioned from the R&D side. Um, one example that we do at my institution, um, so I'm the PI of a magnetic confinement device at the University of Wisconsin that just started running. And we just had a, we hosted a student from the UK. So this provided a hands-on experience for the student to actually run our tokamak and craft and run an experiment too, um, to bring that hands-on experience to students and researchers. Apprenticeships are also another pathway for participation to diversify our workforce. And we've also seen um, there's apprenticeship programs in the UK and also the US, so sharing best practices for that. How do you bring people in from adjacent fields and how do you retain them? And then providing that infrastructure and framework, um, that's what this agreement can do so that more people from a wider variety of sectors can then participate in fusion, both at their home institutions and abroad. And then this, these international collaborations can really help to simplify that process by having government buy-in from the start to provide support to navigate the logistics of bringing in people, especially across nations, and supporting these scholars as well. Um, underlying all of this really is having a healthy climate of diversity, equity, and inclusion. It's really critical um, at these institutions as well. So this focus is, we need to start focusing on how do we improve these climates in our workforces? And we all really need to make a commitment to take immediate actions towards this. Some things that we can look at doing is sharing best evidence-based practices on this on how do we work with um, experts in subject matter, experts in diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility to advise our communities globally to develop and develop assessment tools along the way. So we're making sure that we're incorporating evidence-based practices and making sure that we're doing, we're um, having progress in these areas. We can implement new and updated policies and codes of conduct to encourage inclusion and a sense of belonging for everyone. Um, and then also incorporate, incorporate the consideration and promotion of healthy um, climate efforts as an in integral aspect of the review process if we're um, looking at our institution as well. Um, and then also, we can all benefit from sharing what works in each other's countries. So one example I'll use from DOE in the US is the Renew program. In particular, there's a funded uh, pathways to fusion collaborative center that the Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory is the lead institution of. And they um, are, they're building a collaborative center that's aimed at supporting efforts to bring in more underserved communities into plasma science and fusion energy field, and then to support these, these um, institutions as, as well, to provide a framework of support structure that helps you with the retention aspect of this. 
And the group is also engaging with subject matter ex experts to develop best practices to do this work. And also, I, again, I'll mention student exchange um, programs can be great and those apprenticeship programs that I mentioned as well. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Steffi. My next question will be on public private partnerships. I will begin with Andrew, but I will welcome all of you to also follow up on on that point, because I think it's an important point. So what public private partnerships should look like to de-risk deployment of fusion power plants and how can public private partnerships help overcome technical, regulatory and market barriers to fusion energy deployment? So I'll give the floor to you, Andrew, then I welcome all of you to follow up on this point. Yeah, of course, public private partnerships are critical here. You know, they, this is, uh, you know, private companies, like I said, are building um, proof of concept machines right now that will prove their uh, technology can be um, relevant in a commercial context. Uh, and then they'll move to building pilot plants. There's a lot of open and difficult challenges remaining um, in that span of going from proof of concept machine to a pilot plant. And so uh, having access to the public through public private partnerships, having access to the really incredible research and scientific understanding within national government programs is, I mean, it, it's critical to to accelerating this. Um, companies, of course, could try and uh, replicate this all within internally. Uh, and, uh, you know, that, that's one way of going, but it's not, we've talked about efficiency and, and such here. And, you know, after all, what are national programs for other than to ultimately build pilot plants? And if private companies are building pilot plants, we should be able to partner with these national governments to push that forward. So, so this is critical. Every government's going to do it in its own way. Every government, you know, the 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 uh, culture of public private partnerships and the legal institutions is different in every in every country in every government. And so, the FIA is active in many of these places around the world to 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 talk about the importance and the need for public private partnerships to uh, to show that our companies are are building towards pilot plants and will be the ones that commercialize fusion energy. I think this is this is an important thing. Of course, it's different, you know, the, the markets are different in different places around the world. Energy markets are different and some are more dominated by government firms and some are more dominated by the private sector. But we think there's an inherent e efficiency in having the private sector, the, the ones who will be you know, building commercial power plants. After all, that that's what we're here for is to build power plants that will sell power. Um, it's it, it's efficient to have the one to have the, the private sector be the ones ones to do that. And and um, so that's why it's important. You know, public private partnerships that include uh, government dollars uh, or government you know funding pounds, dollars, euros, yen, you know, won, whatever. Uh, are are important to accelerating this as well. It's uh, you know, but but actually the critical part is is access to the expertise within the national programs and and um, facilitating that and doing it at a speed that is relevant to the climate crisis that is relevant to the energy security crisis. We can't we can't continue to just run at the speed of bureaucracy. We have to run at the speed of business. And I think that's why, you know, our, our, our companies are, are adding that uh, urgency to this. Fusion is so important that we can't just wait. We have to get moving and get on it. Uh, so uh, we think that that's the most important thing. Let's, let's get to work and let's get it going. Thank, thank you, Andrew. Scott, would you like to follow up on this point? And maybe then I'll give the floor to Tim as well. Sure, I'll, you know, I'll mention a few high level principles, you know, that 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 I'm I and the DOE are trying to bring to this conversation. I'm so a couple of things, you know, we think it's important to focus on the strengths and the missions of each sector and, and to work toward aligning their interests. So, so, so that they're, you know, everyone's rowing in the, the same direction. Um, 
you know, we try to connect the public expertise with the very aggressive private development and demonstration uh, pathways. Um, it's important for because PPPs bring in inherently market signals, and, and this ensures that that applied R&D activities in the public sector are focused on solutions with commercial pathways. Um, public programs um, can catalyze greater private investments and efforts, and you know that's that's a central uh, pillar of the milestone-based fusion development program that was launched um, uh, by the Fusion Energy Sciences program last year. Um, and also, there are thoughts on how to leverage private facilities to advance public sector scientific research. Um, you know, a DOE has been approached by by multiple private fusion companies. You know, who are interested in finding ways to to leverage the facilities they have built uh, for, for public sector science. Um, so, but as Andrew says, you know, this there's a lot of learning uh, involved and, and growing pains involved. Um, I think from a policy perspective, we um, have a good feel for, for what programs like the Milestone Program are aiming to achieve and, and what new public-private partnerships might uh, aim to achieve, you know, for example, in delivery of test facilities. Um, but, but this is new, and, and you know, we do look at uh, precedents like the NASA COTS program, and I think a lot of people um, are, understand that such programs have existed. Um, but it's still hard to find, um, you know, the people where the rubber hits the road uh, in implementing these programs because they're still used to, um, you know, programs and contracting ways uh, in typical government-funded uh, programs. So, so we're we're working through that. Um, I'm still, you know, very hopeful that the milestone program will will continue and get off the ground uh, successfully. Um, so I'll, I'll I'll pause there. I'll end there. Just a quick follow up for our audience. Would you be able to briefly explain what the milestone program is and what are the, its objectives? Yeah, thank you. I'm sorry I didn't do that. The milestone based development uh, program is a centerpiece of our bold decadal vision. It is um, private sector led, uh, but with with strong public partnerships encouraged um, to realize uh, preliminary engineering designs of a fusion pilot plant. Um, the most aggressive companies uh, are hoping to do that, say, within the next five years. This is reaching a preliminary engineering design. Uh, maybe some of the earlier stage companies would be, you know, taking a major step toward having a viable preliminary engineering design. So it's a five-year program. It's not going to build the fusion pilot plant, but it's a step uh, toward the eventual construction of a fusion pilot plant that, that will be private sector led. It, it, I think some unique aspects of it that we borrowed from the NASA COTS program, it is milestone based payments, fixed support payments. Um, so the companies sign up uh, mutually negotiated uh, milestones and when the milestone is met, and these are intended to be significant critical path milestones, uh, both on scientifically uh, engineering and commercialization milestones, uh, then the federal government would issue a payment. Um, and, the, and the payment is for the company meeting that milestone. So it's intended to catalyze uh, private investment. It's intended to catalyze uh, focus on the largest critical path milestones, and it's intended to catalyze uh, partnerships between the public and the private sector in resolving those very significant scientific challenges and, and engineering challenges. Thank you. Tim, would you be able to also elaborate on public-private partnerships and UKE's involvement in this regard? Sure. So, um, yeah, um, obviously they're, they're really important. Um, Andrew and Scott have said lots of important things about them and where we're at now. I, I was going to look a little bit further into the future about something that, that worries me and, sh and share, share that with everyone. Um, so, at the moment, we have lots of emerging great partnerships of, of all kinds of different flavors between private sector fusion companies and, and national labs and, and other institutions that are, you know, getting going. And I don't want to sound complacent because they, they have to all bear fruit, but, but there's lots of great stuff happening. I think that once we've, you know, really fully established the, our confidence that fusion will work and we're, we're kind of there or thereabouts, um, a lot of our attention is going to turn to 
actually getting the technology to the point where it's it's just it's deployable it's a product it's built at the right price it's reliable it's schedulable it just has the attributes of a of a of a commercial product and i think getting from um pilot plant stage to that stage is, is something that that's certainly worrying me at the moment and i think the reason i mentioned that in this context is that's going to need another kind of tranche of public private partnerships that aren't really there yet because we're going to have to i say we the, the kind of the larger we the global fusion community is going to have to involve the kind of giant engineering companies who really know how to take product through to a really mature technology that can just be deployed because there is kind of no point in in doing fusion if it's always going to be this scientific niche it has to be deployed widely and make a difference to global energy production and to do that it has to be a mature product technology and to do that it's going to need super large scale resources that's going to need the right kind of organizations in it it also is almost certainly going to need large scale government support in some form or other to make that happen so i think that's the kind of flavor of the next wave of public private partnerships that will be needed to make a difference to the deployment of fusion thank you i have another question regarding the u.s strategy and the uk u.s partnership and that's uh, there are some overlap between these these announcements such as research and development workforce development plans so what uh, what are the possible areas of research and development that can be pursued in concert and together? What are the best areas of collaboration, in your opinion? So I'll give the floor to Scott and Tim, and then I think Andrew Holland could follow up from a private sector perspective and Steffi from how university and academia can help in this. Uh, uh, thank you, Adam. Well, so firstly, the overlap between the US strategy and the US-UK partnership um, is not an accident. Uh, the, the US UK partnership um, was, you know, was the first uh, joint statement issued and it was, you know, at least from the US side, we based it very much uh, on uh, the international strategy, which which at the time was not yet unveiled. Um, in terms of areas of overlap. Yeah, I mean, there, there well, so first of all, there are so many R&D uh, opportunities that there's certainly no shortage of options and, and Tim already mentioned uh, many of them and we're, we're wholeheartedly in agreement there in terms especially uh, from the US perspective areas in fuel cycle and materials and and especially test facilities so uh, resonate with those examples um, you know with the UK we expect that the partnership will eventually touch on all five pillars that 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 I discussed and you know and this may or may not be true with all with all the partners that we hope to engage I'll pass the floor to the next speaker Maybe Tim yeah well I, I mean I think Scott has, has said it really um there there are it, it, there are so many areas of our r and d that uh, selecting candidate ones is 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 not is not the issue it's 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 prioritizing really um i think i already mentioned some of them scott did as well um you know facilities access to facilities i mean the you know the uk um inertial fusion community is you know very interested in 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 this collaboration and developing it I mentioned digital as a huge area that affects all the fusion. Yeah, there are there are a manifest list of of R and D activities. So actually, it's a matter of uh, it's a matter of prioritization rather than trying to seek out some some ones to 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 begin with. Thank you, Andrew. Would you like to follow up on this point as well about research and development and workforce development, and how the private sector can get involved? Yeah, sure. I mean, what I'd say too on uh, collaboration is is great and important, um, but also this is a this is an emerging market as well, an emerging market marketplace, and so it, it, that means that companies are competing with each other. You know, I, I'm I'm here the the Fusion Industry Association, but we have to remember that these 38 companies are all competing with each other, both to be who's first. And also to be that, you know, Tim mentioned the, the efficiency standards and to, to, you know, competition is the way we drive down costs. Competition is the way our free market economy works. 
And so, you know, these these companies will be competing against each other and, and largely also the, the countries should remember that it is a it's a competition for who will host these companies, where these companies will be set up. And, you know, part of that will be the the strength of their R&D. Part of that will be the access to their government programs. Part of that will be the the policy and regulatory environment that that's put up about it. And, and part of it will also be the, the workforce. You know, having a, a workforce that is um, keen to 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 be involved and and uh, and grow within this. So, you know, I I think it's great to talk to talk about. Yeah, we we all want to work together, and you know, kind of the the, the post cop moment is always a rah rah. We we want to be together and work together. But you know, in in the way our economies are set up, the way we actually get there, and the way we actually you know, get to these these goals is competition. Um, and so it's international competition, yes, but and it's also business competition. And so so I think that these are these are kind of a you know, there's a bit of a tension there, but it's right that there should be a, some tension there. Thank you, Andrew. Steffi, would you like to finish off on that point on maybe from a university and academia perspective? Sure, I can talk about that from the the R and D perspective from a university. I mean, we offer unique hands-on experiences where people can actually go and run the experiments. They can modify the experiments. That is very unique and not really available most places. We also have that interdisciplinary research that's available that I mentioned in the in my opening statement, and then the flexibility to really pivot and tackle challenges as they arrive. The other thing we can do at universities is look at the early stages of innovation and really get that fundamental understanding of the physics and the technology as we develop it. And then we can work on developing models and understanding how the technology would scale up. And that's one of the drivers of the experiment that I run is how do you think about innovative ways to start up future fusion power plants through game changing technology? Uh, you can test a different variety of different models uh, and technology to see what works and what doesn't work and develop it and scale it up. And then also the last thing I wanna bring up too is because of these early stages of innovation and understanding, many private companies have actually spun out of universities too. So they're all kind of tied together and they really drive, as Andrew mentioned, that competition too, because there's so many ideas that we're coming up with and then moving forward. Some will, some will move forward, some will combine and it will change. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll ask one more question now that we're nearing the end of the webinar, and then we'll finish off with, with some closing remarks. So to all of you, as you have all quite public facing roles, in your opinion, how can we engage with different stakeholders, such as policymakers, regulators, industry leaders, academia, media or civic, civil society to raise awareness and support fusion energy? Well, in your opinion, how can we do this best? Let's start with Scott. I'll try to be brief here since we're running late on time. Yes. I, I would say, you know, especially to the, the fusion scientists and technical folks out there, you know, go, go to professional and social events outside your own sphere of comfort. You know, that, that's really how I started uh, my path from being a garden variety scientist to, to where I am now. Um, you know, talk to and understand the perspectives of those in other professions who will impact fusion in all ways, from funding to R and D to supply chain to regulation and to the end customer. I think, I think that in the end will be the greatest uh, way, you know, to uh, to start to have broader impact on, on this conversation. Thanks. Let's move to Tim. Um, of all the long things I could say in the answer, I'll just pick one simple one. I think we can do better in using common, straightforward language to describe what we do. Um, you know, the fusion is a little bit tribal still, and each tribe tends to use its own language. The more as a fusion community, we can at least use the same language, even though many of us are doing different bits within that community, the better. So I, I, I'd say common language. Thank you. Steffi. Um, honesty and transparency, we can use that to build build trust. Um, 
We can also partner with people in other aspects of like sociology, risk communication and public engagement and science communication to kind of to build that to effectively communicate. Um, get scientists and engineers to train in science communication. So I'm trained in empathy based science communication so I can do this work and then really sit down and have these meaningful two way engagements with community members. Um, and so we want to really understand their hopes and concerns for fusion and how that technology may align with their values and that can then go on to inform how we design these systems and inform policy. Thank you. Andrew. I think the we should take some examples from other uh, recent emerging technologies and, and how how to build both both good and bad. But but one of the best ways to to build a uh, global awareness is is in fact not to to think about mass communication and you have to convince a hundred percent of the public that fusions you know going to change their lives. What we instead need is. Uh, a book called Raving Fans. We need a small group of raving fans of fusion, a small group of, of really, you know, a cadre of, of, you know, people who are, are willing to, uh, to go out and talk about the, the, the really game changing importance of this. And, and so, you know, we have to, we have to start building this, this communications group from within the, the fusion community. You know, the most effective communicators on fusion are actually the scientists who can speak with authority, but then making like, like both Steffi and Tim said, we have to make sure that they can speak in a language that is um, able to be heard uh, by, by this large, larger group. But then we also have, have to have just, you know, the raving fans who are who want this to happen and are are ma making a demand pull for it out there. Uh, so so I think that that's a key thing that that folks should be focused on and and trying to get that that um, you know that cadre of of really excited people pulling for it. Thank you all for your exciting answers and engagement throughout this discussion. And as we have heard, international partnerships in fusion are the way forward. And the IEA has launched an initiative called the World Fusion Energy Group, which aligns with many of the things we have heard today. Starting from 2024, the World Fusion Energy Group will bring together public and private sectors, industry, academia, and civil society to establish a collaborative framework with a view to accelerate research, development, demonstration, and deployment of safe and sustainable fusion energy to the market. So stay tuned for this. and. Keep engaged as we move forward. So thank you all for attending this webinar. And once again, thank you to all our speakers who have really generously given their time to discuss this important topic. And see you next year for future episodes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks all. Have a nice day.